thank you, Marita, for um, arranging this and supporting this. And special thanks. This is a really special morning because we have Rosanna Warren um, here with us, um, uh, who will be reading um, reading her poem, Cotillion Photo, and that is our subject for today's discussion. And um, uh, I'm so glad uh, and not at all surprised that so many of you are here today and from so many different places uh, around the world. Um, so, um, hi, Rosanna. Hello, everybody. This is a, 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 a party, a poetry party. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> that's, that's what we hope. That's what we want. So um, I will, let me just um, uh, turn this over to you and, um, and ask you to read the poem and, may, and introduce it if you, if you like, but um, you can just read it if you prefer to do that and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Wonderful, thank you. And I will mostly keep my mouth shut while you're talking about it. So. You know, poets shouldn't have too much directive authority over who how to read a poem. Okay, I can't promise. I can't promise that we're not going to want you to say something about it. All right. Well, so, when if you ask, I, but I'm not going to okay. try to direct the reading. I'm interested okay. in how other people read. Um, th this poem was the the first one in my most recent book, uh, so forth, and I'm really glad you chose it, Lloyd, because it's important to me, too. Cotillion Photo. These young women will last forever, posed like greyhounds, trapped in the silver crust of the frame. You can't tell one from another, the breed is so pure. They will never run each one aloft on a frozen wave of white cotillion lace to resemble marriage, to resemble fate. I remember July sun pouring down in a prickly meadow and a garter snake skin laid out like fairy lingerie on a stone wall. This was Connecticut. There would be a stone wall. Crickets were scraping marrow from the day. I was young. I'd been alone for weeks. I painted the meadow morning and afternoon, trying to capture the crackling sound with my brush. I was reading Oedipus Rex. I understood neither the snakeskin nor the play. Your life is one long night, said Oedipus to the prophet. Oedipus, who saw nothing. Oak trees rustled in drought. In saffron grass, small creatures skittered. There came a day when I said to myself, I should prefer to sleep. Small planets tasted dry and bitter on my tongue. And two days later, I woke, alone in the creaking barn, at dusk, not knowing what day, what month, what year, but feeling the hall of earth rolling on its way. It is not your fate that I should be your ruin, the prophet said. I moved my arms, my legs. I unclenched my hands and stood up dizzy from the cot. What was to come would come in its own good time, outside the frame. The moon was rising above the hill. A shy wind gathered force, and trees in their black silhouettes linked arms. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much um, for reading that. Um, it's wonderful to hear as well as to read on the page. Um, 
uh, any 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 just first thoughts, first reactions, responses, um, uh, any guesses about about why I chose this particular poem? Um, oh, Susan, Susan, yeah, you're you're muted. Oh, I was just so enthralled and moved by it because the image is so powerful of the beginning of the women trapped in, in frame. And then the acuity, the aliveness, the, the uh, uh, synesthetic feeling about nature of this young person trying to find the meaning of life and and struggling with it and um so intensely experience things and setting images against one another that somehow all belonged and when when the small plant tastes dry and bitter, that switch into the sleep and then waking up and and I'm not saying it well, but the the image then of the moon rising and her f feeling of the being able to call it a shy wind and mm -hmm. making arms, just the whole way the eye in the poem experiences nature in in all of those dimensions, contrasts with the young women and the delicacy of the garter snake skin picking up the lace and the living creature having left the skin behind but then there she is in this live uh landscape it it just and it makes makes me weep at the end yeah i thank you thank you yeah i i i think i don't have anything left to say <laughs> uh but th yeah um um I was going to I was going to mention Lloyd the uh, uh -huh. yeah what I what I really came across was the the contrast between this photo and the person's situation the narrator who's gone off to sleep in in a completely different place ending up so unphotogenic really in a situation that's not all made up and photogenic and at first i was thinking i i puzzled at the contrast and i was thinking in a way occasions that start with these beautiful photos end up <laughs> sort of in the hungover aftermath of of the great celebration that that kind of a photo is is portending so mm -hmm. the contrast of the two worlds and how you have to pierce through beauty to get to to something that is decisive and deep um that that really came across to me it, it, as a whole the poem is beautiful the language is very precise and very beautiful um and it, it it brings home an image but then the the meaning that penetrates it also an oedipus i just had to uh just laugh i mean laugh in a very now current meaningful way i thought it was just a brilliant really? yeah Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just um the the these um these layers of the of the the format starting with the formality of the of the photograph and then and then life going on uh really um underneath uh, un unpredictable, unforecastable. Uh, life going on underneath. Um, oh, uh, Catherine, yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. 
The first four lines reminded me so strongly of the Ode on a Grecian Urn that I wondered if it was deliberately put there for me to find it, was it? <laughs> no. It will last forever and they will never run. Mm. That they're frozen in that yeah. different mm. work of art. Mm. Yeah. I oh boy, I hadn't hadn't thought of that either, but 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 absolutely it it it's really yeah, it's certainly lying, lying for the for, for the critic to find. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, thank you, thank you for that. Another another dimension. I saw some Wordsworth uh, later in the poem about painting the meadow. Mm. Mm. And what's the line? Isn't the line from the 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 daffodils poem about painting yes. the meadow with delight? Yes, I think so. Yes. And was, was, was that intended? Well, I know a lot of these poems by heart. I mean, Keats and Wordsworth. Sure. So I'm not, I wasn't thinking, now let's paste in some Keats and let's paste in some Wordsworth, but they're in my DNA. Yeah. Whereas putting in the Sophocles, the Oedipus Rex, is of course very deliberate. Yeah, I, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bunch of people who've raised their hands oh know? okay uh good i can't see everyone so that's who's, okay who... hume and then m and then jennifer oh great good yeah. well well hume. speak speaking of, of oedipus you know you know there's a great power in this poem that i, that I felt you, you know the metamorphosis of the snake and then uh of course implied through through that the the dialogue with Teresa's um and and um then finally you know the 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 sleep and and the the awakening that i i guess that planets are pills is that right mm -hmm. um and and uh so i i i just yeah i i for me that seems to be the the uh the the key you know this transformation of this you know, static frame into something, mm. something quite different. Yeah, thank you. M. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, since you invited the question, I'd like to know the answer to why you chose this poem, which I think is beautiful and eloquent. Um, uh, the answer is that it's beautiful and eloquent <laughs> <laughs> and very, very moving. And um, uh, I mean, I think it's just it's just marvelously written, and um, you know, I I wanted Rosanna to read something, and it was um, it it meant I had a lot of great choices, um, but this is the one this is the one that's really um, um. I, I I admire so much these layerings that I mean you read you read the title which I'd love to talk about uh, in a second and Jennifer I I, I really want to hear what you have to say um, but just these layerings that seem very unforced and that as you read the poem have a kind of inevitability about them at the same time you're also surprised to find a reference to oedipus in a poem called cotillion photo <laughs> so there's a kind of wit in that also but then it's so moving and moving about this 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 person the narrator um in relation to all of these things that are going on uh, around her Gen Jennifer, I, I, I'd i rather hear you than me. <laughs> no, d two things. One, I just wanted to add uh, one more uh, uh, set of uh, resonances with an image in the poem that garter snake skin laid out like fairy lingerie to me calls up a midsummer night's dream uh. <laughs> because there's a line there, the snake casts her enamel skin weave mm. wide enough to wrap a fairy in. Mm. I, I suppose it's that combination of the the 
snakeskin and the fairy, but both for Midsummer Night's Dream, that would, and Midsummer, this is a Midsummer Night's Dream poem of sorts. So maybe for me, it sets uh, that comedy next to Oedipus Rex and a, a comedy of, of, of transformation. But the, the other line um, that I really love, well, there are many lines I love, but I keep going back to the line about trying to capture the crackling sound with my brush. For me, it's it's the heart of that uh, sort of second movement of the poem. And there's the contrast between one kind of art that freezes in the frame, like the cotillion photo, and another that's about effort, that's about trying. And I think Susan said the synesthesia of it, trying to capture a crackling sound with the brush to get into a painting, something that still um, crackles uh, in a lively way. That that line for me is sort of the, the dilemma or the challenge, which is also then why in the last part of the poem, what was to come would come in its own good time outside the frame. So we begin in a very frozen frame and we're trying <laughs> this, crack can can you crackle in a painting in a frame and then who knows but what's to come is waiting out there but I, I guess I think of the crackling as a as the gist of of the effort of this poem for me Ma Mary thank you Jennifer yeah I loved I love what you just said Jennifer and I love all everybody's comments and Susan nailed all of the lines that were, well, most of the lines that were making me oh, just just overwhelmingly gorgeous lines, um, Susan mentioned. But um, so I wanted to say something kind of general. Um, and that is one of the things that really blows me away about this poem is the combination of daring. You know, it's, it seems like such a deeply honest poem. It feels like one of the most deeply honest poems I've run across. And it almost seems so honest that it needs its own language. It needs a new, a new kind of delicacy, a new kind of courage, or its own individual um, sort of of delicacy and and daring. And um, gosh, I had something else to add to that, but I can't really remember. It's just, it's just a really stunning poem, and the transformation that happens. This kind of, kind of a, a death of sorts and a rebirth. And I'm just just touching on those planets one more time. Maybe they're they're pills, but but the fact that they're planets is so stunning, and it's part of that transformation that even though the poem is somewhat enigmatic and you know and strange and unique, I think that we readers go through it with with the speaker of the poem. I mean, I feel transformed, utterly transformed by the end of the poem. Anyway, I love it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Oh, and we have a new uh, guest, Ginny, wanted to say something as well. Oh. Go ahead. Ginny, you're muted. I'd just like to say something about the granular level. It might be related to what Lloyd was saying about layering, but as I read along, there were surprising contrasts like there was this billowing lace, but it was cold. And then there's this beautiful silver frame, but it's crusty. And then towards the end, I love the image about the shy wind gathering force. That was one of my favorite lines. And I also had, and maybe what Jennifer said about crackling helps me with this, but as I read through, I'm trying to balance the tension between fate and something else that's less less somehow constricted <laughs> mm. to give hope that there's sort of the unexpected in life and maybe free choice. And I wasn't, the first time through, I wasn't sure that because outside the frame seemed to have a natural coming forward on its own. That wasn't really the decision mm -hmm. of the narrator. So I was a little unclear how um, how much promise 
how much our lives are faded and how much there's the promise of ourselves to create circumstances. I'm still not, I think I would need to read it again, but maybe something Jennifer was saying about the trying of painting the crackling is swaying me more towards a positive sense that fate isn't everything, yeah. Well, this, that there's some tension in the poem between between that, between what's faded and what you can what you can accomplish in in fight fighting that. Um, I I want to I I I I'm in relation to that question. I want to um, uh, talk a little bit about the form of this poem. Because I think something very much related to that, the idea that there's something faded or preordained and also something resisting that. And I think, for me, I think that's reflected in the, in the form of the poem. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it, it is a poem that has a form, but that's also fighting the form uh fighting the 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 the, the preordination of 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 form um and that um i don't know anyone anyone have any any thoughts about that before i before i give my own opinion uh well all right <laughs> Uh, I don't see any hands up. Um, so I'm thinking, I kind of look at this, I, I look at the poem even before I read it, and I see something resembling um, something that might be uh, a traditional blank verse, iambic pentameter, uh, a, re a regular form probably unrhymed with a with a basically five beats in every line da 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 da, da, da or some variation of that and i start reading the poem and i and i and i feel that um that sense of a of a of, of a regular underlying beat but I also feel a pull against that and a kind of flexibility that isn't, I wouldn't say free verse. It's not just, I mean, I have nothing against free verse, but, but that there is, um, there's a pull between a formal regularity, a formal consistency and a, and a pull against that, a pull that um, suggests suggests a kind of tension that between the the fate of da 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 da, da, da mm. and the actual living experience of uh, the, 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 the 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 life experience that doesn't easily fit that form that pulls against that form and i think there's a that in 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 cotillion photo there's this tension between the the formal the traditional form shakespeare of course but also wordsworth and and coleridge especially in these in those conversation poems mm -hmm. of his that are that are both so personal and and yet so universally meaningful uh it's Hume what I I I, I can never read <laughs> I can never read the, the 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 chat comments and I and I I think I'm missing <laughs> something but do you want to say out loud what you just posted well yeah, well, it, it, you know, it's sort of ancillary to the form. I I, I notice the richness of, of sound in, in this poem, 
And I, I think I think it's assonance, is it? Lace, fate. I, I just listed mm -hmm. some of them. Brush, mm -hmm. Rex, that's a great one. <laughs> and uh, Oedipus grass and then barn and arm grass. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I it, it, it's so part of the what's so just beautifully written about this poem is how yeah. is how eloquent those how eloquent it sounds. Mm -hmm. I have to say, um, when I've read it aloud to myself, it's it's just there's a tr just tremendous pleasure mm -hmm. in that. Rosanna, do you like reading this poem out loud? I. I do, <laughs> but I I want to say, Lloyd, I thought what you said about meter and a freer verse and in relation to the notion of fate is just marvelous. It's very exciting to me. Mm. I hadn't phrased it to myself like that, but it feels absolutely right. And, mm. um, and you're right. A number of these lines can be scanned as iambic pentameter or pentameter, if not iambic. Pentameter, yeah. And another, others don't conform. So they're outside that frame. I'm just paraphrasing what you said. But I just think that's really helpful to me, what you said. That's really, and, and it, it sort of formal decisions, whatever the form is, um, free verse, metrical, whatever, are, are, make sense to me only when they carry thematic burden because otherwise they're just exoskeletal right and so you're pointing is exciting to me you're pointing to the way in which the theme of fate which somebody else mentioned about the oedipus to the extent that uh i think it was Ginny. you know to what extent is this a poem about um c coming to some kind of concept of freedom of agency and to what extent is it a sense of, of just following a a, a, a preordained fate um that the formal description you just gave uh, shows how the poem is trying to find its way, enact its way, rhythmically, yeah, uh, to, toward a toward a more complex notion of what it is to be a conscious being, uh, in which some conditions are fated; they're just given, and some conditions are mm. not. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, thank you. My 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 my, my pleasure. Um, my it's certainly too. it's certainly what I what I feel when I when I read the poem, um, and that beginning beginning with the frame cotillion photo. There's you know, I I I, I mean does does everyone know does everyone know what a cotillion is. Okay, I don't see any questions. Uh, I don't see any questions. Okay, so so there's something even in the title. It's very formal, although photo is a little um, a little more um, user friendly. It's not cotillion photograph. So there's something sort of personal in the title, both formal and 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 personal in the in in the title oh i'm sorry mike uh you have your you have a uh a, a, a hand up yeah just i mean just rejoining what you guys were saying and rosanna too the 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 form and and the subject beginning with that cotillion photo which is a very tradition it's a traditional moment in life it's a landmark traditional moment and um and it what it goes into of course is is she out in the meadow painting is evokes perhaps a flip side, an opposition or a contrast to the formality of the tradition. The narrator's the narrator is endeavored in a formal act of painting, but uh, again, a creative act. And I think that coincides perfectly with the blank, the blank verse or, or the, the free verse thing, the, the, the sliding between, um, and I think it's a it's a question very pertinent today. While so many of our formal beacons are being questioned mm. and overturned, even or shaken uh, severely uh, about our society um, in 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 many different ways, uh, 
the thing that was advancing as science is now threatening to overturn us. Um, so I think we need the simultaneity of not just overthrowing the structures that hold us together, but how to live with those as we find our own way, as we change, as we adapt, you know. I think I think the poem is a poem of adaptation, form and adaptation. The um the 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 versification is, yeah. I I I have I have to say, um um Rosanna, this was this poem was in the New Yorker, wasn't it? Yes. And that and that's where I read it for the first time. And I go, oh, you know, I'm curious about the title. And then I get to the I get to the first line. These young women will last forever. And I hear I hear a kind of irony in that, maybe even a, a little satirical note about the formality of the of the picture i was thinking it might be a very different poem but with some similarities if it were called bar mitzvah photo <laughs> hmm. because we know those you know graduation photo hmm. we know, we know those and then you get to the end of the line posed like greyhounds yeah. and it's I just like the roof of my head explodes. <laughs> and I thought, well, I did not expect that. <laughs> and then um what do you what do you think about the greyhounds? I I I think it's just it it's so marvelous and fresh and unexpected and 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 kind of perfect. Uh, at the same time, what what do you what do you make of those of those greyhounds? Um, Bill, uh, um, I, what I thought about the greyhounds was sorry for my voice. By the way, I've got a terrible cold, so I'm going to sound oh, no. na nasal. Um, but um, I I was struck by the way in which greyhounds are introduced. Um, in a simile, and yet it's the um, uh, the the vehicle of the simile which is picked up in the breed is so pure, and its um, breed seems to reach back to the greyhounds, but it also seems to be uh, I don't know uh, uh, criticizing the 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 young women too, and criticizing the whole um, I don't know how to put it really the the, the whole social arrangement um, where mm. breeding and purity of lineage is um, important. Um, I, I should say that I didn't actually know the word um, cotillion, so I had to look this up. And, ah. um, uh, um, but it seems, seems, am I right in thinking that it's some kind of posh coming out ball yes. um, among yes. debutants? Yeah. And I suppose with, with such a social class, um, uh, being able to trace your lineage or your genealogy is an important thing. But here, the, um, uh, the idea seems to be that um, such purity um, uh, compromises distinctiveness. Um, uh, you, they, they merge together precisely because of the purity of their blood. And um, a little bit of impurity is necessary to create an individual tang or something like that but the criticism is muted uh, uh isn't it because um it's introduced in relation to the vehicle of the metaphor rather than the tenor so there's a kind of delicacy in the handling of that criticism it seemed to me uh, I, I mean it's this there's so so many levels seem to be going on at at at, at once that the that element of the sat satirical or the the, the quietly satirical mm -hmm. uh i mean the silver crust of the frame and silver frame and then crust gives it a, a kind of little twist this maybe it's a little stale yeah. um uh, um 
uh, or, you know, crusty is not exactly a compliment. Oh, Denise, I, Denise and Bill, I, I, yeah. I, I'd much rather hear you than talk myself. So Denise and then Bill. You're muted, Denise. So I, I guess Bill um, asked the question that I was going, that I've been wondering about, which is the meaning of cotillion, the modern meaning apart from the 18th century dance, which evidently is what I suspected. It's something um, sort of upper crusty or associated with crust. the debutantes. Crust, crust. Yes, yeah, crust, crust. But you know, when when my hand shot up initially, it was to 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 note the the Grecian urn beginning mm -hmm. and the the general neoclassicism of mm -hmm. of some that I felt through so much of this poem and into which the greyhounds fit, um, and w which also called up for me a poem that came to mind last time, that pound poem about the aristocratic woman dying of, I can't even remember it, mm -hmm. something about the, you know, the unkillable children of the poor thrive is, is the idea, um, you know, of, of the, and, and the breed, the, the Italian greyhound is, they're so, they're charming, but they're so overbred that they can barely keep warm and they sort of shiver a lot of the time. And they're very delicate. They, they can they can suffer, suffer internal damage even from from mm. the you know the tiniest mishap. So it's it's a perfectly evocative um, term for a certain kind of um, fragility, mm. I think. And you know what what pops out of the frame is someone who a protagonist who um, can both fit in the frame and question it and and you know wander away from it and 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 yet does so um, taking taking with her some the classical or neoclassical tropes. Mm. It's a wonderful setting, a wonderful frame, if you will, and silvery. Yes, right. Bill. Um, the, the immobility of the debutante in the, in the frame uh, also seems to, I mean, it seems to me to be setting up the dilemma that leads to a suicide attempt, uh, which is survived by the skin of her teeth. It's a, uh, it's a scary, to me, very scary passage in the poem to think of a young woman who uh, takes the planet pills and only two days later wakens. Uh, somebody who's terribly alone, uh, not there's no one else around, no one to notice. Uh, this frozen cluster of young women in the in the frame, and then the the young woman whose way of not conceding her fate is to take this drastic action. At least that's how I was reading it, and it, uh, you know. I, it, my throat kind of catches to say it. May may I just say I'm very grateful, um, Bill, for your having seen that, um, because there have been people who read this poem who didn't understand that it was deeply frightening and and a near death experience, and that does seem to me important. Uh, and so you've all talked wonderfully about poem of transformation and the snake leaving its skin behind. It's also a poem of blindness. I mean, Oedipus didn't see at all what was going on. And the young person in this poem doesn't see at all what's going on in life. And uh, is also not seen. And is not seen. Um, and so the 
to the extent that the Grecian urn has a role in the first few lines in the frozenness, the static image, the, the, the Grecian urn, um, Keats's poem makes a great deal of, you know, the erotic foreplay, the, the frozen foreplay in his urn. There, there's no foreplay in, in, in these figures. They're, they're just uh, uh, um, trapped. Conven conventional trapped in a, in a fate for, for women in this class. Um, and uh, which is particularly a kind of living, southern women, a living death. Yeah, yeah, well, it would be. The quotations are particularly southern thing, and there's an interesting shift to then to Connecticut. Yeah, and then I I liked I like your word satire, Lloyd, because I also felt the crack about the stone walls in Connecticut, where where I grew up. I I just hoped people would feel that was highly sardonic. Not that oh I yes, totally... I, I, <laughs> I, I I was you 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 preempt my my. Uh... <laughs> Uh, my own um, comment on that line, and I, I I do think it's very witty and funny, and uh, and just a little elbowing the, the, the <laughs> Connecticut um, uh, culture. This would this was Connecticut. There would there would be a stone wall, um, and I think that's another. It's another dimension. I and Bill, I think your your capturing a tragic element in this poem is is absolute. Is I completely agree with. It's absolutely right, and that one of the one of the things I so admire about this poem to continue continue my my attempt to answer M's uh 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 question to me before is that the 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 tone in this poem is so rich and so complicated that it can embody both the little nudge the the joking nudge about Connecticut and Oedipus which is not just it seems to me it's not just a literary reference in this mm -hmm. poem that it's it's really embedded in the in the in the in the emotional texture of 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 this poem um um I just uh they will never run is you know another it seems to me another one of those double double-edged or 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 double-edged isn't isn't quite the right word but but the the that that it's a line that exists on two levels uh that it's it, it's about the greyhounds but it's also about the 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 young women in the in in the palm you can't run in a dress of cotillion lace but the they will never run so there the 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 sense of being trapped um continues um um thank you jennifer by the way because i have been racking my brain about the i i i i knew there was some reference to the 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 snake skin mm -hmm. and i I really couldn't place it, but but having Midsummer Night's Dream and Oedipus in the same poem just also seems like a absolute genius to me. Uh, and... It may be also rather sly about the cotillion, which is all petticoats, uh, and mm -hmm. the shed skin of the snake oh. is referred to as lingerie. Uh, right. So yes. Yeah, I hadn't. There's that bit too. That I hadn't. That hadn't occurred to me either. But um, that also brings up another very Shakespearean point of the cotillion and the and the meadow between the court world and the green world. You're mm -hmm. going back and forth between those two worlds, and that fits nicely. Yeah, Arden. Yeah. Susan, um, did you want to add something? Oh, I'm sorry. Who is? You're muted, Susan. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm 
I'm very grateful we got to this because I was thinking that it might have been a suicide attempt, but I, I was afraid to sort of put that out there. Um, but I'm just wondering now about the end of the poem, the, the, the black, the trees, black silhouettes, linked arms. I mean, it's another barrier, it seems to me. It's another, I, this doesn't have a happy ending, I don't think. Um, and so it's like this young woman is trapped by the stone wall, by the frame, by her aloneness. Um, but I don't know. I'm curious. Just yeah. to add to that, in the quotes, Jennifer just had posted something that that is resonant to what you just said, was that dying piecemeal of a kind of emotional anemia, which mm -hmm. adds also to what William was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's from the pound poem that Denise mentioned. Ah, uh, uh, now uh, I wonder yeah. does you. does this connect to ruin? Because that that word has been bothering me. You know, Oedipus is ruined, and Teresa talks about Oedipus is ruined. How how does that relate? I I I don't quite grasp it. Um. Uh, can 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 you rephrase the question because I'm not I'm not quite sure what you're what you're asking. Well, I, you know the 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 idea that um, Teresa gives to to Oedipus is that it's not your fate that I should be your ruin. Oh, Oedipus oh, is ruined. Now, you, you know I I'm, I'm trying to understand. I think there must be a parallel, um, whether it's simply the, you know, the vision embodied by the photograph that that's ruined, or if it's something, I suspect it's something more to do with what Bill brought up, but um, I'm not sure. And and how that relates to the ending, you know, the, the trees that, um, who was it, Susan just mentioned. And Jonathan, did you want to add to that? Uh, I, I just I see a parallel between the, the, the photograph and suicide attempt as both being uh, attempts to control fate, sort of mm -hmm. trap, yes. trap a final meaning out of something, which is what makes it moving when, when she, at the end, I unclenched my hands and she sort of lets go of uh, needing to control things in quite the same way. That, that was just how I read it. May, may I say something about the end of Please. the poem? Sure. Um, and that is that at least I feel it as hopeful because the person has survived this, this um, brush with death and the moon was rising, which to me is a very hopeful sign. And the shy wind gathering force seemed to me very much a promise that even a, a shy, suppressed, whatever uh, person could, uh, we get back to English romantics and the wind poems there, if it's not a, a wild west wind, at least some kind of wind, which can be the Hebrew ruah, the breath of life, uh, that that breath is possible, and that's a that's a that's a powerful breath. And uh, so, yes, the the the, the dark trees um, linking arms ca could be seen as a barrier. There will always be barriers in life, but somehow I feel that the that the I like the word protagonist. Someone used protagonist is is in a very different state, and certainly. Uh, strong enough to get outside any any frame uh, by the end, and I think I hope the moon and the wind will help give that promise. Mary, thank you, thank you, Rosanna. Thank you. Uh, um... I love I love what you just said, um, Rosanna, and I just wanted to echo um, one of I think one of the most kind of stunning moments is when the hand unclenches. To me, everything shifts there. And um, 
I, I love the feeling that our hands were clenched too, but we didn't really realize it until mm. until they were, you know, until they unclenched right at that moment in the poem. So that was, um, yeah, I think that that also kind of bolsters the sense of a different kind of strength to the, the protagonist. I like that too, is in a completely different place um, at the end. Thank you, yeah. Stephen, Stephen did, yeah. Oh, uh, I was going to um, link something about this inevitability and perhaps a, a release from inevitability. In the early part of the poem, I'm trying to find it again, when she first describes the photo, she says, um, why are they dressed in this lace? Why is it this whiteness? Because they have to represent, uh, to resemble marriage. And then it says to resemble fate. And And my feeling at the time was, these women are dressed up for marriage. And then at the same time, you can picture them almost in their coffins in white dresses, you know, as if they're going to accept fate. We're going to go for marriage. We're going to live a life. And then that's it. We're done. And, and they're, they're bunched together. So I thought the opposite of that is the, I, I saw them as women at the end, the, um, the trees linked arms, except now this is a, 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 a group photo of nature. And even if it's dark, it's nature and therefore maybe being part of something that was bigger. And I love the fact that in that, it, Rosanna does this several times where she has little runs of um, similar sounding words. Uh, uh, she has th uh, three M's in a row. She goes from come, um, from uh, what was to come would come in its good time outside the frame. And I always take the M's as a very comforting sound. <laughs> for mother <laughs> m for tight lips i felt like somehow maybe these are mothering a mothering presence that was going to be there to perhaps guard her as she moves outside of the expectation maybe not to end immediately from wedding to you know to the end of a life thank you mariana you have you have your hand up i wanted uh, i so <laughs> Uh, I wanted to say that I felt, even though it is such a frozen beginning and you can really feel the entrapment, I love the grave <laughs> image because it's exactly how it feels. But at the same time, even in that, you have, I, I painted the meadow morning and afternoon trying to capture the crackling sound with my brush. So there's life in it. It's the that ending is there inside that entrapment somehow and i i also loved the i'd been alone for weeks and the ending is gathered force the shy wind gathered force and trees in their black seawoods linked arms so there is this feeling of not being alone mm. and I, I don't know, there is a way this poem speaks to me so much, and I want to say thank you for writing it. <laughs> thank you. May may I make a confession, um, yeah. Lloyd, that I think I, it just might be interesting in terms of how poems come to be. Mm. Um, I wrote a few years after, just very shortly after this experience, as uh, so I was very young, you know, probably 22, 23, wrote a quite lush decorative poem placed in this time in that space that completely brushed over what had really happened. And I turned it into a very pretty poem and it was published in my first book. Hmm. And years later, when I had come to a much starker feeling about what the art of poetry is for, at least for me, the art of poetry is an instrument of knowledge. And I think poems have, I say to myself, they have work to do. And the work is to find out something that you didn't know before. And I realized that there was a lot more work I had to do with this memory. Mm -hmm. And so this, this poem, Cotillion Photo, is a rewriting of a, of a poem that I wrote probably 30 something years before. And I really needed to do it. It was an excavation of what had been a falseness, an, an early decorative falseness. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I that that makes perfect sense, and I I I I think that's what you know that's what we that's what we do as writers, and I mean, didn't didn't someone say we write the same poem over and over again? Yeah. <laughs> except that we we've learned something new each each time or we're discovering something new each time and um yeah well that earlier poem seems seems kind of almost part of the plot or you mm. know behind the plot of the of the first half of this poem mm -hmm. uh except with a deeper a deeper understanding that I, I my guess is that there was no allusion to oedipus in the in, no in your earlier <laughs> or or snakes or stone walls or i yeah. i mean i i don't have the yeah. book with me i can't even remember except it was very lush and decorative yeah um and and people seemed to like it at the time and yeah and, and i realized it was it was just a it was a deep evasion and you a wrong it. and a wrong hey. use of poetry yeah. Oh, Yehudi? No, I'm sorry. And Jennifer. Oh, John, I'm sorry. Uh, John, John, and it, then. Yeah, you know, when I first read this poem, I absolutely love the ending. And the more I read it, the more I love it because there's just so much positivity there. It's really the speaker getting in touch with, you know, the great femininity in the universe. I mean, the moon is a feminine symbol, it's mystical. And the darkness is something that we all have to go through. And, and the last image is linked arms. And there's this positive direction, go that way. And <laughs> that's what you assume the poem is go, going to be doing. But there's also a level of fairy tale in this story, in this mm. poem. And that the, uh, the fairy lingerie, and also the bitter pills. It's almost as if this is like a Cinderella who has to sort of go to sleep to wake up to her true self. And it's not to diminish this because there's real power in fairy tales. And so even though it's dark, it's a very positive darkness. And this past uh, couple of weeks, I found a great quote from Charles Bukowski, and I'll read it to you. What matters most is how well you walk through the fire. Mm. Mm. And that's what the speaker in this poem does. And so he, she's somehow towards the end of the fire, and now that's going to sort of burn off all these things that don't need to be there in some way. Hmm. So it's it's a marvelous, wonderful poem that just is a you know, great experience. Jennifer, and then I think, Mike, you had your hand up a minute ago also. So Jennifer and then Mike. So uh, first I just want to say I love the line, crickets were scraping marrow from the day. And we haven't mentioned that line, so I just right. I just wanted to get that out there, and then a completely different point, um, not to take away from the hopefulness that people are finding in the end of the poem, but it matters to me that when I read it, I have to ask myself, um, is is this hopeful? These black trees lined up. I mean, it's a very uh, it's balanced right on the edge of being something. Obviously, it's different from the young women at the beginning, but just as you can spend uh, a little bit of time thinking that that beginning scene is beautiful and it is beautiful before you feel the trap, although that's more obvious. I, I think it's 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 not obvious that the the trees in their black silhouettes are linking arms. And it's an accomplishment of the poem to have us feel that that's not another trap or these dark figures at the edge of the world. You know, she's the, the elements here are, um, I hear it in the shy wind. That's why these feel like uh, more friendly trees, but you could have all the same elements in a plath poem and those black trees at the end, <laughs> and and uh, the white white frozen perfect dead woman. I mean, it, the the valence would be different. And I think there's a, a great. This goes back to what Lloyd said about the layers. There's this great poise moving through the different phases of the poem. So you don't say, 
aha, what a relief. <laughs> it's hopeful <laughs> at the end. You know, it's a it's a tentative, what are we waking up into? And could this it's important that we can ask the question, could this be a hopeful ending rather than just saying, I feel all of this hope? Or at least that that's one of the things that matters to me in, mm -hmm. in the ending. Thank you. Uh, Mike and then Bill. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't think Sylvia Plath ever wrote a poem with as much of a meaningful modulation and backflow that this poem has. Uh, just my comment on that. But I was just wondering, you could evoke Oedipus in our time and it would be meaningful, I think, almost anywhere because Oedipus is at, all around us at this time. But I was wondering, and I mentioned in the chat, were were you thinking at all of Antigone in mentioning Oedipus? Um, you have someone who is a part, you have a sort of a, a sign of a rebellious uh, sister or daughter in the poem. I was just wondering if you if you were thinking of Antigone at all. I, I have to just, just to, to be honest, no, I wasn't. And I think that bringing in the notion of a, of a of a, a burying the dead and the god's law versus human law would have been just more than the poem could handle or at least that i could handle in my image i mean oedipus himself was strange enough to put into this meadow with the crickets and the snake <laughs> oh but when you when i hear the rex come out yes. it just yeah. it resonates <laughs> right so well and it's so perfect but i it, it was just it was just an afterthought so well, i wanted to ask you and then another yeah. note i'd thrown into the chat was i liked how she stands up from the cot and how this word cot uh is the first part of cotillion oh that's nice i hadn't even noticed Ooh. that i think so thank you <laughs> oh, yeah. but about about the antigone and the you no know, the sophocles more widely uh, of course the whole by the way, I never had a cotillion. I never came out. This is not my experience. It's just looking at other people's photos in their houses. Um, but not that that matters. Uh, nothing against cotillions per se, except that in terms of Sophocles and the larger world that you're su suggesting, Michael, the um, it's patriarchy. I mean, pa it's, it's the deeply patriarchal structure that would create these coming out parties, which are basically marriage markets for young women. Sure. In their class. Oh yeah. Um. So anyway, Bill, thank you. Um, I'm I'm not certain about this, but thinking about the form, uh, often, um, just in the rhythm of the line, I'll hear, uh, not so much iams as dactyls, mm -hmm. um, you know, particular words, uh, silhouette, for example. There's a kind of uh, dactylic fall. And it it goes back and forth between that lament and um, something that would feel more upbeat. Um, it's not stable in that way. And it's, I rather like that. Thank you. Yeah, I think what we said before, or certainly what Rosanna said before, what I was trying to say was that there's a kind of, there there is a kind of pentameter going through the poem, but it's not definitely not strictly iambic or 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 dactylic or anything else but everything else is is flowing around those what seem to me mainly five beats per 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 line and um with some with an occasional well at least one um uh, uh shorter short shorter line uh which also reminds me of wordsworth and intimations of immortality mm. and mm. and the combining the the regular pentameter beat with suddenly something more something something more intimate uh than a pentameter sorry for the technical <laughs> technical <laughs> stuff uh, but i'm i'm just so in awe of how rosanna ha handles the metrics of this poem uh as well i mean as as a kind of undercurrent to what the poem is what's happening on the 
in 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 the words themselves and the meaning of the words um i i do want to talk about that ending uh mm -hmm. a little more because i i i also i love it so so much uh but be i don't want to i don't want to leave anything out before we before we get to that um um I don't know, just just such beautiful, beautiful writing, among other things in this poem. Oak trees rustled in drought, in saffron grass, small creatures. Oh, there's small creatures skittered. There that there was the there's there's more of that um uh of that alliteration, of that mm -hmm. that mu musicality uh in the poem, and especially in these uh in these descriptions of the uh, of of the meadow um yeah trying to capture capture the crackling sound sound with my brush um uh crackling and capture sound like crackling to me and mm -hmm. sound with my brush sounds like the brush uh I, I you know i mean that's 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 the critic and teacher in me and and my my guess is that this was more instinctive in 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 the actual writing but i don't know whether rosanna even wants to answer that that question well, I I would like to say that all of you who who are anywhere close to my age will remember in the 1980s, even to some extent the 70s, uh, that the 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 wars raging in in um, American poetry about verse form and to write in meter in those years was to declare yourself in favor of the military industrial complex <laughs> and to write in free verse was to declare yourself a fully liberated soul <laughs> and i had my deep training in, from childhood on in poetry was in other languages it was in latin poetry i had great latin teachers when i was uh, in high school, and I just memorized poems, odes by Horace and Catullus, and and to and my lines. But I I loved meter, and I I came to meter almost more through Latin and through French poetry. Then, um, memor I was in French lycée, and I had to memorize hundreds and hundreds of lines of French metrical poetry. And so, not to mention, I I loved Thomas Hardy. I he was a great metrist, brilliant metr, etc. Um, so. Meter was very much part of what I thought poems should be able to do, even in the 1970s and 1980s, which was deeply unfashionable in some quarters. And mm -hmm. but I also love. Um, I'm I'm a student of modernism. I love free verse. I mean, I I, tra I translate Pierre Rouverdi. I translate Max Jacob. I I, I like Frank O'Hara. So I never mm -hmm. accepted this this the terms of this battle. So my training, my deep training, my acoustical training is in meter in various languages. And 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 I think that's what you're hearing, Lloyd. And I'm glad you're, you know, you're noticing and hearing. Yeah. But I'm also refuse to be, quote, framed metrically in an ideology of meter, especially when it's then presented as some kind of politics or 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 that just I just have completely reject now. Thank goodness things have loosened up now. You you can have metrical poets who are, you know, look at Paul Muldoon or A. E. Stallings or any number of metrical poets who are very cool. Um, and that war seems to have simmered down, thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's very that's very reassuring. And and it really um I mean it 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 captures my my own experience. Yeah, I'm older than you are. <laughs> So I, I have I have also lived through that and it captures my own experience with with writing, with trying to write poems. But I it it it's something that I just immediately felt that tension between a kind of formal spine, a kind of formal undercurrent, and then the way you can you can play with that. I mean, you know, certainly 
one of my one of my other favorite poets is Elizabeth Bishop, mm -hmm. who had a very similar response to meter and 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 freedom uh in or, or at least the freedom to play with meter yeah yeah um uh susan yes um i'm i'm really struggling with the conversation a bit because it i'm i understand what you're talking about and the beauty of the language and meter and so forth but i'm once i read this line I was young, I'd been alone for weeks. I couldn't, I couldn't get past that. Because why is she so alone and so young? And I'm waiting to find what's happen gonna happen to her. And I'm concerned and so the meter and the beauty of the, the rustling leaves and so forth sort of becomes secondary to me. Hmm. Hmm. It's like a diversion from the situation. And then there came a day when she says, I should prefer to sleep. So there's something very, um, I don't know what the word is, uh, antagonistic or contrapuntal or Hmm. But the conduct of the narrative is quite tight-lipped, isn't it? It doesn't. It discloses a certain amount, but it, it right. also goes in for a kind of indeterminacy. So the the, the, the line which Susan points to um, about being alone does make one think, "Why so alone?" But the poem the chooses week. not to divulge the details which might illuminate that condition. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, mean, and, and, I mean, that's what's well judged about. Well, one of the many things which are well judged about the poem seems to me to be uh, the level of indeterminacy, how much to disclose and how much to withhold. Yeah. I, I, I have to say, I believe her. I believe the narrator. I think the images in the poem are which i am grateful for profoundly grateful for are doing the work of saying oh i was dumped by my boyfriend and my parents don't understand me or whatever whatever the reason was that she was feeling alone and is out in the meadow by herself um i don't i don't need to know those mm -hmm. I don't need to know those those biogra biographical reasons. I look at the at her relation to that photograph, to the narrator's relation to that photograph, and how could a sensitive how could a sensitive young woman not feel some kind of tension between her life and what is pictured in that photograph and the, mm -hmm. the greyhounds in that photograph. So I, I don't feel I need any further explanation. And as I say, I, I'm grateful that those things are not in the poem. I, I, I've seen too many bad poems in which those were absolutely what, you know, all the, that, that was all the poem was about mm. and not and not sort of confronting the trap of the silver crusted frame and the profound, I don't know, depression that causes her to want to kill herself or to try to kill herself and then kind of coming out of it and i believe that also and i believe it because of how convincing the writing is and i i think maybe now now i i i, I want to talk about that uh, about that ending and and the way 
the way there's something just very three-dimensional about that ending and that I I certainly you can't escape feeling that there was something hopeful in that ending the moon was rising above the hill a shy wind gathering force but those trees and those black silhouettes and linking arms feel so ambiguous to me yeah. that there's something both positive well she's coming out of this you feel definitely feel that but that there's also that it's i don't take it lightly that those about those black trees and the linking arms being well maybe a kind of sisterhood but also a kind of trap a kind of prison and and i love that aspect of the ending that i come away from this poem not feeling just the sort of sentimental well she got over it but that there's something much more dimensional much more complicated in that in that it's it's both a resolution it takes you out of the palm it satisfies you i don't want another syllable to come after that the black silhouettes linked arms but i also i'm feeling i'm so moved by that because I also sense that this this isn't the end of it, and that this struggle, this this um, resistance uh, to all of those traps that start with the silver crusted frames and and yeah, better 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 the trees than the greyhounds. But also, it's just it's not an 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 easy or even it's not just a comforting ending. I feel some real sort of tension and complication in that in that image at the end. And I love it. I'm so moved by it. And I think it's there's also something very mysterious about that ending. And um, and and it's it's what I love most in poetry. <laughs> uh, so here it is. Just set, uh, Jennifer, can you can? I I was just feeling another line we haven't said anything oh, about yeah. is mm. is that is is part of that ending movement. The one that says. Alone in the creaking barn at dusk, not knowing what day, what month, what year, but feeling the hall of earth rolling on its way. Um, that that's the larger movement of time going on that maybe now she will be a part of. You know that the movement starts again, and that's why what will come will come is is in its own good time outside the frame. Um, and and not I to say that she's rolled round in earth's diurnal course <laughs> with rocks and stones and trees but because that puts death into that pattern as well but you know then it says there it's not just my fate e even questions about fate aren't just fate i've woken back up into these larger forces moving on past this moment i i i think one of the riskiest things in this poem and 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 it would be risky in any poem is the allusion to oedipus mm. and that you know, here is here is a lyric poem, a lyric narration, and to, what a risk it is to you know bring into a poem a, a poem like this, you know the the, the 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 biggest you know element of of tragic literature in 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 Western culture. And yet this 
there's something so delicate about I was reading Oedipus Rex and mm -hmm. you and you believe her and then everything that that means and and predict you know predicting one's fate uh has real becomes very intimate and real in this poem but that it also it also sets up a kind of tragic subtext um setting for everything in this poem and that and that i think to get that balance is just extraordinary and and i don't feel oh it's you know oh it's so pretentious to 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 refer to oedipus uh in in a in in a poem called cotillion photo <laughs> and then it just totally works mary is that your hand is up and i think denise so, okay great so uh, mary and then denise okay yeah what i was uh i was just focusing back on those last the last few lines um I think in 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 a, on a subconscious level or whatever there you know there is um, words like rising, um, gathered force mm -hmm. and arms especially um, you know there's a very a very quiet uh, invocation of a kind of a warring a millet millet they're they're kind of words that are easy to associate with uh, a kind of military formation. And it sounds kind of crazy, and that isn't really my reading of it, but I feel that strength gathering um, with, yeah, rising force and linked arms. But my my sense of it is, I mean, and I think the poem is so much more subtle and and multi layered. It's not it's not a battle of um, you know white lace and black silhouettes. It's it's so much more complicated than that, and that's part of what is so wonderful about it but i it seems to me that in this world where it's it's nature it, it's all natural forces rising those greyhounds would be able to run you know even if the mm -hmm. forces and there's something trap like about that it's a natural i don't know i think it's not the same kind of trap at all as the um that crusted silver uh, frame so and I love the ambiguity that it's it's somewhat enigmatic and um but it just it's so delicately done I just wow I can't say enough but it is very powerful ending for me Denise I have to say that I found a lot of menace in that final image of the black trees with their their arms linked um for me they seem to evoke both the fates lined up together and to be a, a sort of skeletal terminal version mm -hmm. of the young women in the photograph at the mm -hmm. beginning mm -hmm. they seem to mirror each other um and while the the linked up trees are not a stone wall. They're more porous than that. They seem very much a fence and a tall fence. So is a, a wonderful uh, ambiguity kind of a, with, with a certain amount of friction um, at the end. And yeah, it's, um, it's an ending that, that doesn't end. And I like that very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, we need to let uh, we need to let Marita get back to work. Um, and uh, but Rosanna, any final thoughts or or? I want to thank you, Lloyd, and thank all of you who read the poem. It's been it's thrilling to hear such careful, sensitive reading, and to hear such care, rescuing the word care from the adjective careful, such care for poetry and for what poetry, how poetry helps us live. I'm really moved and excited and so glad that you're doing this, that this exists, that's still possible in this world. So thank you all. <laughs> oh, thank you. 
thank you so much for 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 doing this um uh you've written a, an absolutely extraordinary poem in i mean you've written others as well but it, it this is i'm so grateful for for the poem and then wonderful to hear you read it and and thank you for your your own generous um part of the discussion and um and again thank you everyone for being here today it's very very special to have a a real live poet <laughs> so uh, so so far <laughs> yeah right and 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 uh and a and and not such a not such an old poem i mean yeah. um so something really very current and 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 part of our own uh experience of 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 the arts in 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 our own lives so thank you thank you so much uh marita as always yes the perfect thank you host and and um and um see you next month um yeah when i have to decide what can live up to this for our next <laughs> discussion <laughs>